we're done with. There's Joe's slides. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so well, uh, while we wait for a couple more people to jump on, sure. uh, for those of you who are new, uh, house rules are we just uh, ask questions as we go. We'll have time at the end for questions also, but if you have a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, uh, and, and jump in. Um, the other kind of news is that next week will be a special uh, sort of episode of the, uh, of, the, of the workshop. So we'll actually be having uh, three, uh, three, three, three presentations uh, next Thursday. Uh, you're welcome to, to come to all of them. They'll all be on the same, uh, on the same uh, link. And uh, they're going to be uh, three PhD students. So this uh, at three o'clock, so this, episode, this time right now, will be uh, Harry Hayashi from, uh, I'm sorry, Harry Lee from the University of Chicago, talking about multinational production and the global shock propagation. Then at 4.05, Armin Candelarian from Rochester talking about inventories, input costs, and productivity gains. And then from 5.10, uh, Giselle Monmont from Harvard talking about stubborn dollarization, love for the dollar, and fear for the peso. So, uh, so next week, Thursday, there'll be kind of more content uh, if you'd like to jump on and see uh, what some PhD students are, are working on. There'll be more, uh, more uh, information in the, in the email uh, as usual. Okay, so then uh, let's go ahead and get going. Joe, you have an hour and then we can talk some more afterwards. Okay, uh, awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Kim and George and everybody for inviting me. Uh, and thanks a lot to everybody who's joined in, giving me your attention today. I know it's a little hard to uh, give much attention to anything outside of the election stuff. So, you know, uh, any attention comments and all that very much appreciated. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, I think that you know everybody would probably agree that with all the stuff that's been going on in the last couple of years, Brexit, you know, U.S.-China trade war, now COVID, uh, this is a pretty interesting time to be an international economist. And at the heart of a lot of these issues that we're we're thinking about uh, is really you know how bilateral trade between country pairs evolves uh, over time in you know response to different kinds of shocks. And basically, this paper is about trying to understand the micro level forces that underlie uh, bilateral trade adjustment dynamics. Uh, and I'd say over the past you know, 20 years or so in this field, if we've learned anything, it's probably that heterogeneity, firm level responses, they play crucial roles in driving aggregate trade outcomes. Uh, so I think to start to understand bilateral trade dynamics, starting at the firm level uh, makes sense as well. Uh, we already know that, you know, uh, from some work by lots of people who may be listening in, Costas, Jonathan, Sam, uh, and lots of other people, that when we go out and look at what I'll call, you know, the static long run cross sectional facts uh, about exporting, export participation, existence of, you know, lots of small firms, concentration among uh, the biggest firms, these facts vary a lot across export markets. And in particular, they vary systematically in that you know, harder markets tend to have less export participation, uh, lower concentration, and that these facts have important implications in, you know, in a quantitative sense, and that they tend to mean uh, higher you know, bilateral trade elasticities in these harder markets. And so what I'm gonna try to do is go at this in kind of a same way from a dynamic perspective, thinking about uh, you know, dynamic micro firm level facts and their implications for aggregate bilateral trade in the short run and the you know, transition to the long run. So in particular, uh, I'm gonna ask how and why do exporter dynamics vary across markets and what are the, co the, uh, the consequences for this variation, of this variation, sorry, for bilateral trade dynamics. Uh, so here's basically what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go about doing this. Uh, First, I'm going to use uh, customs data from Brazil to document, you know, that the facts about exporter dynamics do indeed vary systematically across destinations. In particular, in harder destinations where we do see less concentration and, you know, uh, lower export participation, we also see higher turnover, higher exit rates. We also see less pronounced uh, what George and Kim would call, you know, new exporter dynamics, new exporters or larger and exit uh, less often relative to incumbent firms in these harder destinations. Uh, then to understand these facts, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build a really simple model. It's gonna have one mechanism 
Uh, and basically that mechanism is gonna combine the, you know, some of the insights from Costas's JPE paper with, you know, the sunk cost approach that's used in a lot of uh, dynamic general equilibrium models. And what I'll show you is that with this mechanism, you can simultaneously account for, you know, what I'll call again, the static facts, export participation rates, existence of lots of small exporters, as well as all the important dynamic facts, turnover, new exporter dynamics, et cetera. Uh, and I think, you know, what's cool about this model in my mind is despite the fact that it can account for all these things endogenously, it's really simple. It's really tractable and it's highly amenable to, you know, dynamic general equilibrium analysis, as I'll show you. Uh, so what I'm going to do is once I've built this model and shown you how it works, I'm going to take it to the data. I'm going to calibrate it so that it matches these facts that I'll show you uh, and then conduct some experiments with it to try to study some of the implications for bilateral trade dynamics. So I'll look at, you know, permanent trade reforms, kind of the most common experiment. We'll look at temporary exchange rate shocks as well as trade policy uncertainty like I've studied in the past. The basic message you'll get out of this is that regardless of what kind of shock you're looking at, you're gonna see larger and more prolonged responses to you know, trade shocks in these harder destinations. And I'll show you some evidence that seems to be consistent with the story that we've seen in you know, Brazil's 1999 big depreciation. And kind of a corollary of this is that we also see larger effects of policy uncertainty in these harder destinations, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, and we can talk about that if we've got some time at the end. Uh, so very briefly, uh, I'll talk about the literature. One thing I think that's really fortunate for me here is that, you know, Costas, George, and Kim have already done all the work for me, basically, in their, uh, you know, latest review paper on the dynamic trade literature. And in fact, they've actually uh, written explicitly about what I'm doing. Um, so at the end of the paper, they discuss some open questions in the literature, and they basically come right out and describe what I'm, what I'm doing here. So the quote at the top is basically telling you what I'm doing. Um, I do want to mention a couple things about the literature before I move on, though. First, there are, you know, a number of other papers in the, you know, dynamic trade literature that look at, you know, customer accumulation, as I'm going to do. What are the main differences here? Uh, number one, I'm using this mechanism to understand differences in exporter dynamics across destinations. Uh, second, uh, the fact that, you know, the way that I interpret this mechanism can account for uh, you know, both the static and dynamic facts that have been documented both here and elsewhere without resorting to any other kinds of exogenous variation in uh, exporting costs across firms. And because of that, you know, the model that I've built is tractable enough to think about it in the context of, you know, a multi-country dynamic general equilibrium model. Uh, finally, let me just mention, there are a few uh, other papers at the end here that are looking at you know, exporter dynamics in multi-country or perhaps multi-industry settings. Carter's got one, I've got a couple of them. Uh, again, what's new here is trying to integrate you know, uh, our understanding of exporter dynamics you know, with, as Costas, uh, George and Kim are saying, with our kind of static cross-sectional understanding about how the you know, geography shapes exporting costs. Um, one final thing before I get into the, the details, let me just give you a preview of how this is gonna work. So in basically any model of exporting, there's some kind of export participation cost. We'll call that F, right? It governs what firms export and you know, how many, you know, perhaps how much they sell. So mallets, you can think about just a standard scalar fixed cost. Cost, this is JPE paper. You know, we've got a convex cost that you can pay to reach some fraction of the customer base. Uh, dynamic sunk cost model that fixed cost might depend on whether or not you're currently an exporter. Currently, you know, normally we think about this as, you know, a large startup cost and a smaller continuation cost. What's going on here is I'm also going to have a, you know, an exporting cost. I'm going to call that F. It's going to depend on how many customers you've got today, M, and how many you want to reach, you know, next period. Uh, why is this, you know, simple mechanism going to allow me to get all this stuff? Well, this marginal exporting cost, right? The derivative of your exporting cost with respect to how many customers you wanna reach, F sub two, that's strictly positive just as in cost, this is JP, JP paper, even you know, for the very first customer. That, that's what gives you the extensive margin. Uh, it's convex, that's what gives you concentration, things like a least traded products margin. Uh, but the interesting dynamic stuff comes in here. 
namely the more customers you currently have, the easier it is to reach that, you know, the, the same level of customers tomorrow. That gives you, you know, exporter hysteresis. It also gives you new exporter dynamics. So essentially, uh, if you've got zero customers today, you choose some, you know, customers to reach some level of customers. Next period, your marginal cost is going to shift down a little bit. That's going to make entrants start small, and then they're going to grow gradually over time. And also the same property is gonna mean that that marginal cost of the very first customer that you might serve or might not serve, that marginal cost that governs the extensive margin, that too is gonna to shift over time and shift with how many customers you serve. That's what's gonna give you endogenous exit in general. It's also what's gonna give you gradually uh, rising survival rates over time. Uh, Finally, uh, you know, this, again, marginal exporting cost, it's also going to vary across destinations with, uh, you know, destinations purchasing power in the way that you might expect. Marginal costs are going to be higher in harder destinations. That's what's going to deliver on a lot of this variation in these facts across markets. So that's basically how this is going to work. Uh, let me now get into the data, uh, and then we'll get into the model. So the data is pretty simple. Uh, lots of people here have seen this, kinds of data, this kind of data before. What I'm looking at here is data from, uh, from Brazil, customs data on all Brazilian export transactions between 1996 and 2008. So we've got you know, destination, we've got the export value of the transaction, the year and the month, uh, an eight digit product ID, and a unique firm identifier. I'm gonna apply a little bit of processing, not much, I'm gonna get rid of everything other than manufacturing. I'm gonna get rid of you know, destinations that don't have at least 20 exporters in every year uh, of, the, you know, of the, uh, the sample. That leaves me with 63 destinations to look at. And then I'm just gonna create a panel at the firm destination year level. I'll also look at some stuff at the firm destination industry year uh, level as well. Entrance gonna be defined as firms that export to uh, a particular destination D in the current year T, but not in the previous year. Incumbents export in both the current and previous year. Exit is going to be defined as when a firm exports in T, but not in the next year. Okay. So with these definitions, basically what I'm going to ask is, how do the static cross-sectional facts about exporting, as well as the life cycle facts about exporting vary across destinations? Here's just some summary statistics uh, to start out. You know, huge variation in uh, export participation across these destinations. You know, on average, we go from 30 exporters per year all the way up to, you know, almost 4,000. Uh, on the static cross-sectional, you know, margin, there's a lot of variation, both in terms of the concentration of exports among the largest exporters. What I'm gonna look at is here, just the, you know, the share of exports accounted for by the top 5%, the top five share. Uh, it's also kind of interesting to look at, you know, what is the average number of other destinations served by firms that export to a particular destination? So some destinations, you know, like the United States, for example, uh, most firms export to only a few other destinations, but some other, you know, destinations are served only by firms that export to a lot of other destinations. And again, this is you know, broadly consistent with stuff that's been documented elsewhere. Uh, this is the dynamic stuff. You see a lot of variation in overall exit rates. You see a lot of variation in the size of the average entrant relative to the size of the average incumbent. Some destinations entrants are really small. Some they're almost as big as the average incumbent. Uh, and you also see a lot of variation in the, uh, the exit rate of entrants relative to incumbent. And here I've just kind of shown you two representative, easy and hard destinations to get your minds going here to suggest that this variation is indeed systematic. So the US and Indonesia, US export participation is really high, Indonesia pretty low. Uh, exporting is very concentrated in the US. Most firms serve only a couple of other destinations. The exit rate is relatively low. Entrants are really small relative to incumbents, and they're more likely to exit. Joseph? Yeah, go ahead, Sam. I had a question. 
because yeah, what you're showing you US versus Indonesia kind of fits my prior that you get into the US, no big deal. So you're not so, but then your max seems to indicate there's one country that's even beyond the US and then they sell to many, which kind of goes totally against what I would have expected. No, okay, right. So perhaps this table is a little bit misleading. So each of these rows is just looking at, you know, uh, say this is across all destinations, the mean export participation rate, the mean top five share. This is- Oh, oh, oh I see, okay, so. Okay. So let me just go here. I'm just going to the next slide because this is gonna, I think, clear things up. So yeah, my point here in bringing up the US and Indonesia is just to suggest that it does seem like all this variation is systematic. Just like, you know, Sam and Jonathan have shown that, you know, in easy destinations, most firms serve only a few des uh, other destinations and there's lots of small exporters. The same kind of systematic variation is also true about these exporter dynamics facts. Namely, in easier destinations over here on the, to the right on the x-axis where there's lots of exporters, exit rates are lower, entrants are smaller, uh, and entrants are more likely to exit uh, you know, relative to incumbents. So- hey, Joe. Yeah. Um, just just a, a little bit of a definition on your exit rate. These are one-year exit rates. Um, just one-year exit rates. So, I mean, often we see firms like exiting and then coming back, like they just take a one-year break. Um, and I would think that that would happen much more with, with kind of these smaller markets. Have you looked at that? Like, you know, how, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure your, your fact is right. It's just a matter, at some point, I think you're going to try to uh, discipline the model with some sort of slope, right? Um, Maybe. Um, so, right at it, basically. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, you know, if, if we're thinking about there's some mechanisms that would lead to temporary exit uh, that are outside of your model, um, maybe we want to sort of be no. targeting these kind of like multi-year continuation probabilities. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about, you know, re-entry today, but what is also true is if you, uh, and I'm not, gonna, I don't have it here in the slides today, but if you, you know, for example, uh, regress survival on tenure in the, you know, in the data, you know, what you typically see is survival rates are rising with tenure. So you go, you know, if you've been exporting for five years, you're a lot more likely to survive the following year. That's true in the data. Uh, it's, you know, you also, you do see the same kind of variation that you'd expect in those kind of, uh, you know, life cycle survival profiles. Mm -hmm. uh, in easier versus hard destinations as well. Um, you see that both in the data and in the model. I think this is just kind of an easier way to uh, wrap your mind around it, but you know, okay. you can cut it that way as well. I have done that. I don't have it here today, but I am not going to be speaking about re -entry. Okay. Um, so this is basically what I'm showing you here is the kind of broadest way of thinking about these facts that, 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 I, want to that I want to tell you about. If you, you know, want to be a little bit more rigorous, you want to say, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in different time periods, say in Brazil, I mentioned the big, you know, real exchange rate depreciation in 1999, or perhaps you're worried that, you know, variation in the industrial composition of Brazilian exports across destinations might be doing some of this. Uh, you can control for those things as well. Uh, everything here I'm showing you uh, is consistent with what you see uh, here in terms of the slopes, everything is uh, statistically significant at the 0.1% level. Um, one thing to mention here, I'm, uh, you know, looking here at the number of exporters as my right-hand side variable as kind of a one degree, uh, one dimensional rather summary of difficulty. You get all the same stuff if you want to think about, you know, the exogenous destination characteristics that might drive difficulty, you know, GDP per capita, population, trade costs. And exactly, that's exactly what I'm going to do in the model. Here, I think it's just a little bit easier to you know, show these facts by summarizing it in this way. All the coefficients are going to go in exactly the way that you would expect if you want to use the, you know, kind of a multidimensional representation of difficulty instead. Uh, but the basic findings here are that I want to reiterate are that just as the static quantitative literature tells us, we see higher concentration in uh, easier destinations. What's new here is you see uh, lower turnover, uh, more pronounced new exporter dynamics. So exit rates are lower overall, but entrants are smaller and more likely to exit relative to. You know, I'm, 
do you mind going back to your figure? I thought that showed the opposite here, um, where you show the relative, this e, I'm looking at the lower right. Okay. And it says number of exporters and it looks like the exit rate's going up. This is, okay, so this is the overall exit rate here. Up oh. here in the top right. What this is here is the exit rate of entrance relative to the exit rate of incumbents. So this says that uh. in really easy destinations, Entrants are 30% more likely to exit than incumbents on average. Whereas over here in more difficult ones, they're only about 20% more likely to exit. Okay, sorry, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, so no, Sam is actually is exactly right. It is important to be precise here. You see lower turnover overall in easier destinations, but new exporters are more likely to exit relative to incumbents. So absolutely right, these slopes go in opposite directions. Okay. Yeah, and so I'm gonna to try to capture both of these things. Uh, a couple other things you might be interested in, you might also be interested in asking, you know, instead, you know, how do exporters on average perform across different destinations? You might also ask, how do individual exporters perform dynamically within their own portfolio of destinations? Uh, and this is kind of ongoing. What, I'm, what I've got here basically is just exit rates, basically just showing you turnover within an individual exporter's portfolio of destinations. Um, on the left-hand side, you just see, you know, kind of the standard distributional facts. Most exporters only serve a couple of destinations, but exports are accounted for broadly by guys that serve a huge number of destinations. That's standard. What, what I've got over here is if you look at, say, firms that serve 10 plus destinations, how likely are they to exit from their most important destination in terms of sales versus their least like least important destination? And so what you see is that they're really unlikely to exit from their most important destinations, a lot more likely to exit from their least important destinations. That said, if you look along the diagonal, you still see that even amongst uh, you know, the least important destinations for the, you know, really multi-destination exporters, they're still less likely to exit from those least important destinations than guys are that export to only one destination. So you see a lot of variation in dynamic performance of exporters within, you know, exporters portfolios as, as well as kind of this just overall cross-destination performance. Um, so this is, I think there's lots of other interesting things to be looked at along, you know, in this kind of vein of that's still ongoing. So any suggestions on this would be more than welcome. Uh, that is basically it as far as the data. Those are the kinds of facts that I'm motivated with. What I want to go to now is the model that I'm going to use to try to account for these facts. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's a pretty simple model. Um, the model has, you know, some basic building blocks. We've got J importing countries uh, indexed by little j. Uh, they've got three traits. So just as I said before, we think about in the data that export participation is driven by the underlying both you know, geographic and income characteristics of countries. That's just what I've got here. So we've got population, GDP per capita, and a, a trade barrier. We've got one exporting country. That exporting country is populated by a unit measure of firms you know, at a very high level the cost of exporting to each of these importing countries depends on the level, you know, the number of customers you'd like to serve, as well as how many more customers you're serving today than you did last year. Uh, what I'm going to show you for now, this is just, you know, kind of the simplest version of this model, partial equilibrium in two ways, small open economy in that, you know, all of these exporting country or the importing country characteristics rather are exogenous. So everything going on in the exporting country uh, is not going to affect, say, income or prices in the importing countries. And also, I'm going to imagining that, you know, uh, the export sector, or at least the, you know, export sector to a particular uh, importing country in a bilateral relationship is relatively small compared to the overall size of the importing country's economy. Importing countries' uh, wage is normalized to one. Uh, what about firms? So firms are heterogeneous uh, in a couple of ways. They're heterogeneous in their multilateral productivity, which I'm going to call X. Uh, and X is just going to be fixed uh, over a firm's life. They're also heterogeneous in demand. And each firm is going to have 
uh, a different level of demand in each foreign market. And those demands uh, are going to you know, evolve over time. You can think about them as demand shocks. Uh, evolve over time independently according to uh, you know, this AR1 process. Finally, firms are going to be heterogeneous in their customer base in each foreign market. I'm going to call that M. Uh, that's just the number of customers in each foreign market that you can serve, somewhere between zero and one. So Joe, just a clarifying question. The, is the Z here then demand per customer? Uh, yeah, it's demand per customer. You'll see that in just a minute. Okay. Exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and it's important to recognize here, you know, this, the way of firms having, you know, productivity and, uh, you know, bilateral demand this is just kind of one way of doing it. You could do it however you want. You could do it instead, you know, firms perhaps have a different productivity in each market and they're correlated. Lots of different ways to set this up. What's important is that, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity among firms and there's some kind of correlation, you know, across destinations at the firm level. That's pretty much all, all you need. This is just the simplest way to set that up. Uh, firm creation and destruction is exogenous. I don't have endogenous firm creation. Firms die with some probability that's associated with their productivity. Uh, more productive firms are less likely to die. When a firm dies, it's replaced by a new firm that has no customers anywhere. So that new firm has got to start over from scratch and build their customer bases up. Uh, production, standard, constant returns to scale, standard, you know, monopolistic competition stuff. Uh, so what about demand? So Jonathan asked, what about this Z? Is it demand per customer? Exactly right. Uh, demand in this model is going to be straight from cost. This is JP paper. And of course, you know, EKK's uh, adaptation of this to a you know, quantitative trade environment. Uh, each importing market J's demand for a firm's product depends on the price of that good, the bilateral demand shock, as well as the number of customers that that firm can currently access. Uh, each individual customer has a you know, da standard downward sloping demand curve. Here you see that demand shock Z. When you aggregate that up, you got to take care of the number of customers that that firm can serve. This is what you get for the you know, total demand uh, for that firm's product in a particular market. And again, this is totally standard. There's nothing new here. Uh, pricing and- so, Joe, Joe, just a quick question. Um, yeah. So you've got, everyone's got the same demand, but there's different costs of reaching each one of these customers. Uh, Is it okay, so maybe let me back up. Demand sorry. shock is idiosyncratic. No, I, I, with, not for the, sorry. Each individual in the country have the same demand for your product. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's just reaching more customers. Um, you've got heterogeneity and how, how easy it is to reach these different customers. You've got heterogeneity in how many customers you have. Yeah, that's right. Through the, through the heterogeneity and the cost of reaching more, more and more customers, right? Yeah, so I haven't uh, said anything about where this M is coming from. As of now, you know, it's just some undefined heterogeneity across firms in M, but yeah. Yeah, no, but you, you wrote down the cost structure for the, the fixed cost before, right? Um, so, really yeah, my, my, my question was really like, I could have thought there being like a, a fixed cost of reaching customers and customers were heterogeneous in demand. Um, is it going to be isomorphic to, to think about that? Like some uh, people write down those kinds of models. A fixed cost, a fixed sunk or scalar cost of reaching more of reaching an individual customer. Yeah, where, where you'd kind of be picking off like better and better customers over. Uh, sorry, you'd, you'd be picking off worse and worse customers over time. That's. I think it is analogous to. As far as I know, this is analogous to that. Yeah. But, but let me let's maybe hold off on. Yeah, that. I'll save that for later. Sorry. Let me sorry. Just uh, okay, uh, the other thing that's standard, pro, you know, pricing and profits, uh, because firms have constant returns to scale, you can solve the profit maximization problem separably across markets. Uh, so you're just going to do the standard thing, set price to, you know, the constant markup solution, uh, earn some profits that depend on the destination characteristics, the number of customers that you have, M, and your idiosyncratic firm level characteristics, your multilateral productivity and your bilateral demand, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna call, collapse all this, you know, de exogenous destination level stuff into this thing. I'm gonna call this pi tilde J. It's just a, you know, a constant destination level uh, number, okay?
So all that stuff is standard. Uh, what's the new stuff? So here's where M is going to come from. Uh, each firm's customer base in a particular market follows a law of motion. Uh, law of motion looks like this. It says your customer base tomorrow is equal to the number of new customers that you attract, which I'm going to call N, and the number of old customers that you retain, which I'm going to call O. So notice that the number of the potential number of new customers that you can reach, that's decreasing in your current customer base, right? The higher your M, the fewer potential new customers are out there. Similarly, the higher your M, the more old customers there are out there to retain. Uh, so how do, you re how do you attract new customers and retain them? You gotta pay a cost. Uh, the costs to attract and retain customers look like this. Uh, I'm not going to go into the math underlying these things. The, take a look at the paper if you want to see where exactly how they're derived. Uh, what I want to point out is they're basically the same as, you know, what's in Costas's paper. The only thing that's different is that these things now depend on M, your current customer base. It shows up in here in terms of this total size of the customer base you're advertising or marketing to. And it shows up over here in terms of, you know, the fraction of that potential base that you are successfully attracting or successfully reaching. Um, parameters of this thing look pretty similar uh, to what they would look like in the static context. These size here govern the, you know, the overall level or scale of these costs. You can think about them as the closest analogs to fixed or sunk costs in a standard like sunk cost model. And indeed, if you set these convexity parameters gamma to zero, that's exactly what they would be. So that's, uh, you can set those convexity things to, to zero and you'd have a sunk cost model. Uh, these alphas, just as in the cost is static world, they govern uh, returns to market size. So the lower alpha, the easier it is, you know, or the cheaper it is per customer to market in larger markets. So you get that variation across destinations in the you know, cost of attracting customers from. Joe, can you, without going into the math, can you just kind of tell a kind of story of these functions, sort of like with cost yeah. is where you're dropping down flyers and so on? Yeah, that's exactly what this is. So there, it's totally unchanged other than that, if you wanna you know, say, drop down flyers to a particular market, that particular market size looks like this. If you're trying to attract new customers, the number of new customers that you can potentially attract depends on how many customers you have. That's where that one minus M comes from. Other than that, it's the same. So to follow Formal on Sam's question, Joe, you've built it. I see LJ appears here. Yeah. So you're building in that larger markets have inherently different dynamic since everything else is a share right yeah so this is a you know the number the you know your success in attracting potential new customers what fraction of potential new customers yeah so so you're building in that big markets are going to look different than small markets yeah and that's ultimately going to be disciplined by these alphas okay right yeah so these alphas are going to control that exactly and can you give us a hint about what we're going to be finding? Yeah, so as a preview, what you're going to find when you take this to the data is that attracting new customers looks a lot more like, you know, TV advertising. You get big returns to scale. Trying to retain new customers is going to look a lot more like kind of trying to reach customers one by one. Returns to market size are going to be smaller. Kind of, okay. kind of as you'd expect. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to show you exactly what the, you know the the calibration results look like. I'm going to discuss that you know uh, later on. Um, I haven't talked about the individual properties of these things yet because I think it's more useful to talk about the properties of the overall uh, exporting cost function, which I'm going to get to now. So if you want to you know get into the details of where all these properties come from, the math, again, take a look at the paper. I don't have time to go through you know all of it today. I think in an hour. So I'm going to try to use my time as best I can. Um, but given these attraction and retention costs, what are you going to want to do? Well, conditional on choosing to go from M today to M prime tomorrow, 
you're going to say, okay, I'm going to choose, you know, how many new customers I want to attract and how many old ones I want to retain to minimize my overall exporting cost. So that's the, what you might think of as the first stage of the firm's problem. Okay. That's all you're going to do. Uh, that's going to give me this F, this thing that I showed you before, the exporting cost. This has a number of key properties that I mentioned that are inherited from the properties of these guys. And all these properties are pretty familiar if you know, you know Costas' work and you know, Jonathan and Sam's work with Francis. Uh, the marginal cost is positive. And in particular, the marginal cost of even the very first customer that you attract or retain is positive. That's what gives you selection. That's what gives you both endogenous entry as well as endogenous exit. So it doesn't matter how many customers you have, the first, the cost of the very first customer is always going to be positive. Uh, that marginal cost is increasing. That's what gives you concentration. The better firms, either more productive or higher demand, they're going to reach more customers, at least eventually. This is the new thing here. This is how this marginal cost varies with the number of customers that you have and the number of customers that you're trying to reach. So your marginal cost, F sub M prime, is diminishing in the number of customers you currently have. I'm gonna show you a picture that illustrates this a little bit more, more easily in just a minute, but that's what you get, that's where you get new exporter dynamics from. Uh, so here's what this looks like. Imagine plotting, uh, against on the x-axis, you've got how many customers you're trying to reach on the y-axis, your marginal cost of reaching them per dollar of purchasing power in the market that you are exporting in. So what you see is that in blue, here's the entrance marginal cost curve in an easy market. Here's the marginal cost curve of an incumbent that's already got some customers. It's shifted to the right. So within a given market, that cost curve shifts to the right as you accumulate more and more customers. Okay. Uh, as you go across markets, go to a harder market, everything is shifted upwards. So it's more expensive to reach the same level of customers in a harder market. That's pretty much where all the action is going to come from. This stuff vertically, that's, where, that's what gives you the cross destination stuff. This stuff horizontally, that's what gives you the dynamic stuff. Okay. Uh, what's the remainder of the firm's problem? Uh, dynamic problem looks almost identical to the dynamic problem in a sunk cost model. Choose how many customers you want to reach to maximize your profits minus your exporting costs plus your continuation value. The only thing that's different is that M or M prime are continuous. They're not just, you know, a binary choice. But other than that, it looks identical. Uh, the solution to this thing, first order condition, uh, looks like this. On the left-hand side, you've got your marginal cost. Same thing I've been plotting on the previous picture. That's what's on the left-hand side of this first order condition. On the right-hand side, you've got your flow profits today from reaching an additional customer. And then you've got your continuation value. Okay, what's your continuation value? It's just your decline in exporting costs tomorrow. Okay, uh, and this thing here happens to be negative. So the more customers you reach today, uh, that means you know, your exporting costs are uh, gonna be lower in terms of trying to reach the same level of customer base tomorrow. As in any dynamic model of exporting, uh, the extensive margin stuff is gonna be governed by thresholds. Here, there are two thresholds. So there's an exit, uh, there's an entry threshold rather, which is a level of demand, the lower bar. That's a function of your productivity. That just says that you're going to enter only if your, you know, uh, benefit from doing so on the right hand side exceeds the marginal cost of reaching the very first customer if you start out with zero today. Okay. Similarly, your exit threshold, which is here going to be a customer base level. So you're going to exit if you've got fewer customers than M lower bar, which is a function of both of your, your productivity and your level of demand. So it's going to be kind of the same. You're going to exit if your marginal benefit is lower than the 
you know, marginal cost of continuing, reaching even the very first customer, okay? Uh, but other than, you know, but qualitatively, look, this looks an awful lot like kind of a standard sunk cost model. The only difference is this guy's continuous and these, you know, thresholds look a little bit different. But Jeff, doesn't that have a funny implication that you're going to be bigger when you enter than when you exit? Uh, it is going to generate some hysteresis. Yeah. Uh, actually, well, okay, no. So it is not going to do that. Let me show you why. I'm going to show you in pictures. But it is going to generate some hysteresis in that when you enter, you're going to be kind of gambling that you might, you know, perhaps get a better shock in the future. Uh, and so you may shrink if you get a bad shock. That's certainly true. Um, but no, you're, you're actually, I misspoke. You, it is not true. You are going to start relatively small and grow. And again, that is because your marginal cost curve shifts outwards to the right as you accumulate more customers. Okay, so let me show you exactly how that works in pictures. Perhaps this is gonna be the- oh, So it's harder to get your first customer when you already have some. No, it's harder to get your first customer when you don't have any. Yeah, that's what I thought. So since it's easier, so the second line there, the left side is a smaller number. I just thought that would mean that uh, you, you wouldn't more, exit it. If you, you've already got- around. Yeah, so here, let me draw a horizontal line this way, all right? So this says, you know, what is the marginal cost? Actually, maybe do it vertically, right? What is the marginal cost of reaching a certain level of customers? If you've got zero, it's the blue line. If you've already got some customers, it's the green line, right? So it is indeed lower here than here. But isn't any sunk cost model going to give you that the exiters are smaller than the entrance? Is it the uh, any sunk cost model to give you that the exiters are smaller than the entrance? Yeah, because of the option value. You're going to get some hysteresis out of that as well. You don't, you're not, it's not going to give you any kind of new exporter dynamics. Yeah, but I mean, it would give you this difference in the thresholds. Yeah, absolutely. So this, this model does inherit naturally some properties of some cost models as well, just by virtue of the fact that it looked an awful lot like one. Uh, so let me show you how this works very quickly. Uh, start out, imagine you start out with no customers. Uh, you've got a good demand shock. You want to enter. How are you going to determine how many customers you're going to choose? Well, you're going to equate your marginal benefit, this horizontal line with your marginal cost. This guy, that's going to pin down the first value of your policy function here at zero. So left-hand side, marginal cost curves. Right-hand side, policy functions. Next period, your cost curve shifts to the right. Even if your marginal benefit hasn't changed at all, and indeed it will change slightly because of a change in your continuation value, but here I've kind of drawn it, ignored that. Uh, you're gonna accumulate more customers. So you're gonna grow. You're gonna move upwards along your policy function. So there's where your new exporter dynamics are coming from. Next period, same thing. Cost curve shifts to the right again. Now imagine you get a bad shock. All of a sudden, your marginal benefit falls down so that it is low enough that it's below the marginal cost of reaching even the first guy. Now you're done, you're gonna exit, right? So in red, you can see the policy function associated with a lower level of demand, right? And indeed it is zero here, says you're gonna exit. Now. One thing to note that's kind of interesting about this that you don't get in sunk cost models, which is that if you hung around for one more period, you might stay in the game. So here's the point at which the firm might be willing to stay in the game if they had a sufficient level of customers. If they've got fewer customers than this, they're gonna say, nah, I'm gonna exit. But if you've got a sufficiently large number of customers, you're gonna stay in the market. So that's kind of how this, how this works. That's where you get new exporter dynamics, endogenous exit, you know, all the kind of properties that you'd expect from this kind of model. Um, that's how it works. Uh, I'm supposed to say something about solution methods. Let me just say it's pretty darn easy. Uh, you can use the endogenous grid method so you can solve for this thing in not too much more time than it takes to solve a standard sunk cost model. Uh, 
or perhaps, uh, you know, uh, George Kim and Horag's model of exogenous new exporter dynamics. That takes about two seconds for all the destinations in my data. It takes about 10 seconds or less to do it in this model. That means that solving, you know, transition dynamics, embedding in a general equilibrium model, you know, not too difficult. Uh, and in fact, my paper on Brexit a couple of years ago is, uh, illustrates how you can do this with a preliminary version of this model. Uh, so it's certainly possible. You could even do business cycle analysis. Uh, I believe that's also certainly possible. The only costly stage here today is the calibration. And that's because I'm gonna simulate, you know, a panel of firms and process that panel exactly like I process uh, the actual Brazilian data for each candidate parameter vector. You know, that takes some time. Uh, so I got 15 minutes left. Let me talk about that quantitative analysis. So I'm gonna calibrate the model to match the variation, you know, that I showed you before across destinations and exporter uh, distributions and dynamics. S experiment with some transitions, see what happens in response to different kinds of shocks. Uh, I don't think I'll have time to do this today, but in the paper I compare to, uh, you know, some other kinds of models and see what you get, uh, sunk cost models and other variants of that kind of thing. Uh, we can talk about that after the talk if anybody wants to stick around. Uh, Destination characteristics are gonna come straight from the gravity database. Everything else is going to be jointly calibrated using indirect inference. I'm gonna run the same regressions on the mod simulated data in the mod that I do in the model. Uh, and I'm gonna to try to minimize the distance between uh, the uh, parameter estimates that you get from the simulated data and the ones you get from the real data. Uh, so there are uh, basically you know, all of these uh, parameters, uh, we've, uh, all of these moments rather, uh, 10 moments. I'm also gonna target the multilateral export participation rate. Uh, for each of these moments, I'm gonna look at the average across destinations as well as that slope coefficient that we were looking at before. Here is what I get. Uh, I think Jonathan, or perhaps it was Sam, asked me about, you know, what do we get in terms of what these parameters look like? What kind of advertising are we talking about? You know, is advertising more like dropping flyers or advertising on the radio? Uh, so here, panel C tells you about the new customer attraction costs. That return to market size is a lot smaller than it is in the return to market size in uh, the market size parameter for customer retention. Tells you that that market size effect is stronger in marketing to new customers. Uh, you got a lot more convexity in trying to attract new customers. It's a lot harder to attract a big block of new customers all at once than it is to try to retain a big block of old ones. That's partly what delivers the you know, new exporter dynamics in the model. Uh, finally, these scale parameters that I said are kind of the closest analogs to a fixed or sunk cost it's, that you would see in a sunk cost model, they're about the same uh, for new customers and old customers, which tells you, uh, which is kind of like what you see in, you know, models of exogenous new exporter dynamics, where you don't need that large of a startup cost relative to the continuation cost because you are forced to start small. Here, you're starting small endogenously, but for the same reason, uh, you're getting kind of similar costs for new entrants and, uh, and incumbents. Uh, you can kind of visualize what those costs look like. Uh, there's a lot of variation endogenously in exporting costs across you know, individual firms within destinations, as well as across destinations. Uh, costs are you know, in levels highest for more productive or higher demand firms and also in easier destinations. But when you measure these things relative to the profits that firms are earning, it's actually most expensive to export in harder markets. And it's particularly expensive if you're not that good, if you've got a low demand shock or a low product. Uh, here's the fit. I'm still working on this. It's not perfect, but you can see that the model broadly replicates all the facts, you know, the trends that I showed you gets you the concentration on the left, gets you the dynamics and the variation of those dynamics across destinations. Uh, okay, so 
Oh, this one too. I forgot about. Wait, that. wait, wait. I'm, I'm hey. gonna pause. I'm gonna pause you. So what? Do, I, I'm like lost on what we want. Like, what's the want operator here with the model? You know, what are we doing? Uh, kind of thing. Like, is it is it like new facts? Is it like, you know, yeah, so, is it, does it do better than the 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 traditional sunk cost models? That's what I mean. I, I'm like missing this whole thing. Right now. Yeah. So. I don't think I'll have time to talk about that latter point, but if you want to stick around afterwards, I'll show you, I'll show you how the model does against other models. What I, the one operator that I will show you in just a moment is what the model predicts for aggregate bilateral trade dynamics. Um, before I do that, let me just mention uh, this model does also get kind of the other aspect of the distribution uh, and dynamics that I mentioned, performance of individual firms within their uh, destination portfolios. Uh, mostly, you know, firms that export only to a few destinations, but exports again are accounted for by the largest firms. Uh, the largest firms are relatively unlikely to exit, but they're more likely to exit from their least important destinations. And they are still less likely to exit from their least important destinations than, you know, the smallest guys that only serve one destination. So the model's doing not a bad job. Uh, what does the model predict in terms of aggregate bilateral uh, trade dynamics? So here's what can we do with the model uh, in conducting, you know, trade experiments? Hey, Joe, in yeah. terms of anything, you, you more calibrated it to cross-sectional stuff. And then this one thing about exit, that was really only the, dyna the only uh, dynamic bet, thing, right? Uh, exit rate, relative entrance size and the relative exit rate of incumbents as of entrance as compared to incumbents. But, but what about getting some sort of growth uh, statistics to fit? Somehow I feel like you don't have anything about that. Uh, yeah, so if you, I don't have that here today, but if you, you know, one of the things you can do is validate the model by say running a, you know, a regression of size and survival rate on tenure. Uh, you can do that in the data and the model, and you're going to get similar things. But that's not what I'm targeting. So this is the stuff that I am targeting. Let's, that, I want to be clear about that, okay? Uh, this stuff, you know, I'm, I'm not targeting this stuff. I'm not targeting, you know, anything about, you know, what are the, uh, you know, survival rates of a two-year exporter versus a three-year exporter. The model does a pretty good job of generating those kinds of things as well. But those are not what I'm targeting in the calibration. Um, again, with the last couple of minutes, I do want to say what the, the implications of this are. So uh, what I've done is just you know run the transition dynamics for a, a couple of different kinds of experiments. Uh, what would happen if you were to simulate here a permanent trade reform? I imagine the trade costs go down by the same amount in each destination. What would happen? Uh, you get a lot more action on the extensive margin, on the firm level intensive margin, and in terms of aggregate trade in harder destinations than in easier ones. So in the long run, the fact that you see a larger, you know, trade elasticity, you know, larger firm level intensive margin, larger extensive margin change, that's exactly what you get out of like the static version of this model that, you know, Costas, Sam, and Jonathan have worked with. What you get out of here is what happens along the transition. And you can see that it takes quite a bit longer to converge to the long run in the harder destination. And it's precisely because it takes a lot longer for firms to build up along the intensive margin. Okay. Joe, what's a harder destination? Is it a towel? Yeah. I forgot to mention that. So in this picture, what I mean by hard and easy is uh, oh, I, no, I do say it here. Uh, hard oh. is the bottom 50% in terms of export participation rates. Easy is the top 10% of destinations in terms of export participation rates. And that combines the tau with this, the market size. Yeah, so this is just the same way that I would do it in the data. I'm just looking at number of exporters, what's driving export participation, exactly the destination characteristics that you would imagine. If you, I'll just jump back very briefly. Uh, if you were to run these kinds of regressions on GDP per capita, population, and tau, you get all the coefficients that you would expect, both in the data and the model. Okay. So 
this export participation again is just kind of a one dimensional summary of those characteristics. But, uh, but the characteristics, the exogenous characteristics it's reflecting are both market size and tau. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I have not, uh, here I'm not showing you what happens in, you know, a high tau versus low, uh, high tau versus low population destination. That's true. I am lumping them together. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's what you'd get if you were to do a permanent trade reform. You could also experiment with, say, a temporary real exchange rate shock. Again, you see uh, the same kind of thing. I would interpret that as, you know, one way to say that is more pronounced exchange rate hysteresis in harder destinations. Uh, the initial shock lasts longer in terms of aggregate exports. And that's because, you know, you get more pronounced hysteresis in terms of export participation, but also because you get more buildup on the, you know, firm level intensive margin that takes a longer time to dissipate after the initial shock. Uh, you might ask, is this kind of something that we see in the data? Uh, yeah, in fact, it is. So if you go out and look at, say, something that I can look at in the data, you know, the same data set I'm using to calibrate the model, which is, you know, Brazil's big real exchange rate shock in 1999, a lot of people have written about the relatively anemic, you know, export growth in response to this kind of shock. This happens in Brazil and lots of other countries. Uh, relatively low trade elasticity, even after a couple of years in response to this kind of shock. And many people attribute this to relatively slow adjustment along the extensive margin. It takes a little bit of time for new firms to start entering. But, you know, most people have just looked at this in terms of aggregate trade flows. What happens if you go out and look at it in terms of different destinations? Well, what you see in response to this shock is indeed a lot more response in the harder destinations than the easy ones. Now, I'm not going to claim that I have any, re any great idea today as to why there's such a large, you know, the difference is quite stark. You see a much larger difference in harder destinations than in easier ones, both in terms of aggregate exports, extensive margin, and the firm level intensive margin. But the fact that you do observe this big difference on the firm level intensive margin, here measured just by the export growth of incumbent firms that were already exporting in 1998 and never exited in the subsequent four or five years. But that fact that you do see this pattern over here suggests that there is indeed this, you know, uh, role for differential market penetration dynamics across destinations that is corroborated by the theory. Uh, one final picture I'll show you before I conclude is you know, I've been interested for a couple of years in trade policy uncertainty. Lots of people have a hard time getting trade policy uncertainty to do anything in a standard dynamic models. Doesn't work in a sunk cost model. Doesn't work in, you know, a model with exogenous new exporter dynamics, at least in general equilibrium. You do get quite a bit more action in this model, but only really in harder destinations. Now, I'm not going to say that it's gigantic, but it's certainly on the order of a couple of percent. So here what I've done in this picture is run the same permanent trade reform, but imagine that every year there's a 50% chance that that trade reform might get reversed. So kind of mimicking the, you know, China US scenario between 1980 and 2000 that many people have studied. Uh, and, you know, this model simplicity allows me to do this quite easily. Uh, what you see is that trade policy uncertainty does reduce the extensive margin both in hard and easy destinations, but it also really reduces the firm level intensive margin, particularly in harder destinations. And that translates into a you know, relatively noticeable difference in trade elasticity in response to an uncertain trade reform rather than a certain one. And we're getting that in this model because largely of you know, this nonlinearity that's embedded in the model through the export cost structure that you don't get uh, in you know, standard stunt cost type model. Uh, I think I am out of time. So I'm gonna skip some of the other stuff that I'm happy to jump back to if people like to stick around. Uh, but I've shown you using some Brazilian data that both the cross-sectional distribution and exporter level dynamics differ quite markedly across export destinations. Harder destinations, uh, we see, uh, or I guess I've got easier on the slide here, we see higher concentration of exports among large firms, 
lower overall turnover, but more pronounced exporter dynamics, a new exporter dynamics rather. And I've shown you a simple theory uh, that accounts for all of these facts uh, by, you know, synthesizing, you know, some existing theories essentially of static endogenous market penetration costs and dynamic sunk costs. Uh, the model predicts some what I think are data consistent responses to trade cost shocks across destinations. Also has some kind of interesting implications for other things that we think are important these days, like you know, trade policy uncertainty. Uh, obviously, this is you know work in progress, so a lot of work to be done. Uh, so any comments that you guys have are more than you know more than welcome. I'm happy to stick around, you know, for however long you guys want to. All right, great. So now we'll uh, kind of open up the stream for questions. You can jump in, or if you want, you can raise your hand or or send a text to the chat room that says you have a question. Um, I'm going to start first uh, yeah. since I'm already unmuted. So uh, this is a bit related to what Jonathan was asking about. So in the model, the 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 things that are different by destination are kind of like size and 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 tariffs, I guess. How does the Z work? Do you know? Do you, are you getting a Z for all J destinations, even if you're not in that market? Uh, yeah. So you are drawing a Z for every destination, even if you're not in that market. So. Your demand shock for each destination is just following a standard AR1 process. Okay, so every period I know exactly what my Z is, even if I'm not in that market yet. My Z is, yeah, so I could, and you know, that's going to give you some, you know, the, the kind of uh, option value stuff that you see in some cost models. If I observe yeah. a bad Z today, I know that even if I've got, you know, I'm a pretty good guy in general, but I've got a bad Z in a particular destination today, it might be worth it for me to wait around until I get a better one. Yeah. So, okay. So then I guess uh, my question is something that you haven't looked at yet, but um, in the model is the, is the variation in Z enough to sort of break a strict sorting about which countries you enter first, second, third, because uh, typically these models, you enter the biggest or whatever the cheapest country is first. And, and there's sort of like a hierarchy of which markets you want to go into yeah, so that Z, I guess, gives you, so, I'd be interested to know what it was in the data and then, uh, what that kind of would look like in the model too. Certainly the, in the model, it is enough to, there, we do not have strict sorting in the data. Uh, sure, certainly. Firms are, you know, certainly on average, firms are entering the easier destinations first. And that's why you see, you know, down here in the really easy destinations, most firms serve only a few destinations. Whereas in the harder ones, everybody who's in there serves a lot of destinations. So you do see sorting, but it's certainly not strict. You do mm -hmm, see some mm -hmm. firms that get lucky in these hard destinations. And, you know, even if they're not as productive as the average guy in that destination, they're going to enter anyway because they got lucky. Joe, could I build on this for a second? Yeah. So the, the reason why you don't get sorting is that the demand shocks are firm specific, right? The demand shocks are firm specific. They're idiosyncratic, yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, if, if the, if the demand, no, if, and that's, I want to be clear here. So this is a, you know, we're looking at a snapshot from the model steady state, right? We're not so thinking about sorry, the within a destination over time at the level, you know, uh, at the bilateral level that affect all firms simultaneously. Yeah. So one thing that they didn't get, so how do you calibrate them, the demand shocks? Yeah. So uh, again, I'm sorry, I lost it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I know I went fast over that. Uh, in the, the model or in the data, rather, I don't observe. Uh, I don't I only observe trade, you know, export transactions. So I'm not I'm not observing the firm's domestic sales. So what I'm using is the moments that I can observe in the data. I'm observing you know, the average exit rate across markets, I'm observing the way in which exit rates vary across markets. Uh, those things are what are helping me inform, be inform me about these, you know, these shocks. Uh, you, you exit if you get a bad shock, right? And so how likely you are to exit is governed in part by, you know, how likely you are to get a bad shock, uh, which in turn is governed by, you know, how persistent your demand is, you know, and if you get a bad shock, you know, what the, the mass of really bad shocks are, right? Uh, so I, I'm using only the moments in the export transaction data to, to infer these things. Now, you'll note that the, you know, the persistence of these demand shocks doesn't really look that different from this annual frequency, by the way, from what you'd kind of expect from, you know, a firm level productivity. 
Uh, now, it's important to recognize, as I said before, that the interpretation of these as demand shocks is relatively arbitrary. You could instead, if you want, just kind of collapse this into a single firm level productivity that is also, you know, differs across destinations. But yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. I'm fine with that. I mean, you could have exactly, you could have a combination of domestic productivity and foreign productivity. Yeah, would be completely exactly. This is just yeah. like the simplest way that you can yeah. think of to capture that. You've got yeah, some yeah, yeah. correlation within firms across destinations, but also some, you know, heterogeneity within firms across destinations. That, that's pretty much all I'm asking for, asking here. Still, I think it will be interesting to get a sense of how far from sorting you are in the data. That, okay. That's something that I think will be good to see. I mean, yeah, I, I don't have a, a clear measure of that. All I can, all I can show you is, you know, uh, this picture here, which tells you that there is a fair, a fair amount of relatively strong sorting. And I guess, you know, uh, to some degree, this stuff here also gives you some sorting as well, because it tells you that firms really are more likely to, you know, exit from their least important destination. So those are the ones that are the kind of the most tenuous. Uh, now, which ones are those? Are they because of the destination characteristics? Or, you know, what fraction is your, you know, kind of uh, destination rank governed by destination characteristics versus your own idiosyncratic demand shock? I can't tell you right now. I don't have that. Uh, but you're right. I, it's worth, I, I should try to figure out how to calculate that. But Joe, in the picture you showed us with the downward slope, it looked like the models generating more, more sorting than the data. Is that fair to say? Uh, if you don't have all that heterogeneity in the blue, there's a huge amount of up, up and down. Well, it's, I don't have as much, certainly there's not as much variation around the trend, absolutely. The slope coefficient is pretty darn similar. Yeah, no, I mean the variation, which would be you like a firm that should have been having many customers that only had 10. Uh, okay, fine. So in that sense, I okay, no, you're probably right. I probably do have more sorting. You would need... Yeah, I need there's there's something else uh, either, you know, I guess my the way that I would interpret that is that there's some additional firm level heterogeneity that is responsible for that firm destination bilateral heterogeneity that I'm not incorporating into the model. I mean, that that'd be one way to do it for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's certainly true. One very heuristic thing is just to rank the destinations and then see how many firms follow the rank and then the deviations from that and what would be predicted by a marginal that was independent. Sure. That and answer is Stefania's. Right. Um, can I, can I follow up on Stefania and Jonathan's comments just for a second? Because I think, um, you know, people have looked at how firms grow and, and I'm actually thinking, I'm actually thinking back to Jonathan's paper with Jim. I don't know if Jim's still on there where they were actually looking at customers, right? And they sort of looked at firms, how they enter, how their customers grow. And I think your model basically says that like over time, um, my sales per customer are dropping. Is, is that right? Sales per customer are dropping? Because the Z is basically like when I come in, I, I come in with like a high demand shock and I know that. And then over time, I sort of stay in that marketplace. And so I think like, I think there's a lot of papers that, that um, I don't know, I don't know what the evidence is on that. I, I, th I, I, I think I remember like those papers not really having that feature. Sure. Um, where like, a, you know, the first guy you sell to, you kind of keep selling to him at a, at a high level and you're kind of growing that market first and then you're adding more customers. So I think it would be interesting to, to think about that. Um, Sure, and I think there, sure. there is some, some question as to like how much you know about the quality of the, the market ahead of time. And a lot of people have kind of pushed, sure, lots of people have pushed like, that you actually don't really know like how much you're going to sell. And so I think it'd be interesting to. Yeah. I to mean, sort of, I, I imagine you could do this kind of, you could probably figure out a way to do this kind of thing with learning instead, gotcha. would be my guess. I, I don't, I don't know, but I imagine that you could easily figure out how to set this up through all in it, learning entirely rather than, uh, you know. It, it just could be uncertainty about that, that first draw. Like you don't actually really know how good you are and there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, until you do it. So there's really some information. Part of that investment is actually 
the investment cost is, is actually the investment in the information. Yeah. yeah, we actually didn't get that much mileage out of learning, at least uh, in, in terms of how the aggregates behave. But uh, I think this model behaves kind of like art. I mean, it's a gradual growth in, in the uh, customer base. And then, uh, I mean, exactly, it is, that's what it is. It's a gradual growth in the customer base. Yeah, I'm just thinking you guys also looked at like, I'm selling to one specific customer. How does that relationship change over time? And, and I, don't, I don't think that looks like what you guys, I, you remember your paper better than me, probably. Um, <laughs> I remember all of your papers, That's quite well, all of, yeah. both of your papers, but I, I thought you had something like that. Um, yeah, no, there, there is an ongoing customer relationship that dies endogenously. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I can't say that changes the aggregates very much to have that, but, but it is in there. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, your sales per customer over time are going to be driven by the evolution of your Z in this model. Yeah, which is mean reverting for the most part, I think. Uh, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So Z must be picking up uh, exchange rate effects as well, right? Uh, Z, Z, is not, Z is idiosyncratic. So it's not picking up aggregate. I mean, sure, but, but when you calibrate that, doesn't it uh, kind of mix the two together? Uh, I have taken out, so I have got in the precise slope coefficients that I'm S that I'm calibrating to here are the ones in this line here. Those do have time fixed effects taken out. Uh, so there's some aspect of, you know, multilateral exchange rate stuff that is going to be subtracted from this. It's, it does not seem to be quantitatively important. Um, these slopes here in this picture and these slopes are basically the same. Uh, can you, maybe can you elaborate more on what you mean by the Z's are picking up? Well, I was just thinking through time, if I'm an exporter, I'm th my market participation is going to depend upon my expectations on where the exchange rate's going. And there's, oh. there's nothing in your model that's going to do that. So I think it's going to get thrown partly back onto the Z processes that you just made. Okay. Uh, that's true with the caveat that I would think that all uh, that firms would have to have very different beliefs about where the exchange rate is going to go. Uh, we don't have, I've taken out any kind of, you know, Z effect that is correlated across firms. So to the extent that firms have similar beliefs about where the exchange rate is going to go, uh, Z is certainly not going to be, I'm not using, Z is not going to be trying to capture that. Okay. Well, I mean, one thing that is very interesting that you showed uh, in the beginning, this new exporter dynamics uh, in different markets, the easy market versus the, the hard market. Now, I mean, the easy markets, as, as you defined it, uh, I mean, these are basically markets that are served by more firms. And I would expect that these are also the markets where each firm sells more products. Uh, so yeah, I have not looked at multi-product firms here. Right. Uh, what I have, so, but, what I have, my, my, is, what I is, here is, okay, go ahead. Sorry. I, I'll, I'll, maybe this is not answering your question, but I do want to say, I've done this at the industry level as well. Uh, so looking at a firm destination industry year panel as well, and you get the same, you get. At least qualitatively, you get all the same, you know, uh, trends. Right, but what I have in mind is something, you know, basically, you know, thinking about a multi-product uh, model. If a firm has a core product, uh, so I guess the, the I guess the more you know, finer uh, comparison between across markets would be like the first product of the firm in the easy market relative to the hard market. Would that still be different? Uh, that, that's, that's, you know, in other words, the, the difference that you that you find might be due to the fact that you are comparing, you know, the first product in one market, in the in the hard market where you know firms don't sell much, to the average products that the firm is selling in the easy market where they might sell, you know, ten products, and the dynamics of the tenth might be completely different. Uh yeah, I think I think you're probably right. Uh, I know that there are some people that have actually looked at, uh, and I, I would refer you to, I think 
that there's a, a line item in the, the big list of papers in the review article, George, is that right or not? Uh, multi-product dynamics and multi-product firms, maybe not. I guess multi-product, you know, many, many products in, in, you know, in different markets. I mean, you, you don't find much of that. Actually, yeah, no, so I, I, I am not looking at that. Um, to some extent, I don't observe, well, I, I have relatively fine-grained products here. I mean, certainly you could, you could, I think you could look at that. I haven't looked at that. Um, I guess it would be interesting to think about perhaps uh, the exit rate of, you know, within a firm's product portfolio as well across destination. I don't know that anybody has looked at that or not, but my guess is it would probably mirror kind of something like what you have in mind here, where this stuff here is kind of the, the exit rate of the, you know, the worst uh, of the you know worst products. Oh no, this is the this is the hardest destination. So you're thinking they're selling their core products here. Right. Uh, well, this is this exit rate here lumps in. You know, this really is only exiting from all products simultaneously. I guess so. I, I can't. I guess I can't really speak to that today. Okay. Thanks. I'm gonna ask. So let me follow. So. You said it, the model is set up in like a small open economy, and then you did the multi-country thing. And so, how how did you piece that all together? Like, is that everyone's small open economy, or? Uh, yeah. So this is yeah. So the way to think about this is a one by one. You can think about if you want to think about it this way, it's a one by one bilateral trade policy reform in a in a GE world. If you want to think about it like that, whereas the rest of the world is large, so it's a we're always thinking about a small open economy relative to the rest of the world. We're, you know, Brazil's exports can't change the United States. Yeah, um, I was just thinking like in these uh, figures, like if you think about the, the GE response is gonna yeah. respond whether well, it's a hard or easy market to get yeah, into, so, and then that would either amplify or unwind. Yeah, you know, so well, one thing I wanna mention about this, by the way, about the GE response is I think the most important GE response that I'm probably missing here is the you know, firm creation margin, right? And George and Kim, you know, their, their paper, and I think Carter's work on this as well, indicates that for uh, multilateral trade reforms, this firm creation margin is really important. That plays a large role in driving these, you know, uh, long run trade elasticity dynamics. I don't have that here, but uh, I'm okay with that interpretation in that I think that if, you're, if you are really thinking about a bilateral trade reform, do you believe that liberalizing trade with one country is going to have a huge impact on multilateral firm creation domestically? A lot less so than you would think a big, you know, multilateral trade reform would have, right? Uh, so I'm relatively comfortable without that margin in here. Uh, do I also think that, you know, a bilateral trade liberalization is going to affect, say, domestic wages significantly? Yeah. To some extent, you'd think that a you know a reform with the United States might have a larger effect than a reform with Uruguay. I don't know. I, well, I that's don't. The, know. I mean, that like I think that's kind of the interesting thing about this particular figure right here is that the uh, is like there's all these like phase in issues associated with these trade agreements and yeah. kind of what this is saying is like, you know, the way you should phase this stuff in should depend on like the type of market that's being integrated. And so it's like, if it's like, it's the hard one, then, sure. you know, you, you'd want to do one thing. And if it's the easy one, you want to do something else. And then the question, and I'm just like wondering like how much, you know, these kind of responses depend on the, the equilibrium feedback. So, yeah, but that's, so I think that's the, I mean, I like, and then going back to my original question about like, what's kind of, what's, what are you after here? I think this is kind of, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of on the outside of the firm dynamic stuff, but I think this kind of looks like the most unique stuff, so. Yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, I, I think that these implications are, you know, one of the, the, the most interesting things that you get out of this. I do think that, you know, there's a lot of work to be done thinking about, you know, uh, some kinds of GE experiments where you do get some effect of, you know, bilateral trade reforms on domestic, you know, uh, economic conditions. I think that is something that I would like to do. I think it's worth, it's worth asking, you know, to what extent is liberalizing trade with a big, easy destination like the U.S. going to affect your wages and through that, you know, affect how these dynamics are going to play out versus a really small destination? I don't know. It's, it is a good question.
And it's something that I want to do. I don't have an answer for you right now. Jill, I'm really, I really urge you to unpack a little bit more hard and easy into okay. nearby, because I think easy for Brazil could be Paraguay or the United States. And, and you obviously, your model obviously distinguishes them because of the alpha. Yeah. Okay, fine. That's fair enough. And there's a big welfare because it's saying here that if the fact that your alphas are coming off of scale, and it's yeah. saying there's something there's something in the dynamics that's inherently different about big markets. About a about the U.S. Or, okay, so you want to say Brazilian export participation? A great example, I guess, is Argentina and, and the U.S. Brazilian export participation. And let me I'll jump to yeah. this summary statistics table. I believe. This one's Argentina. Okay. So export, the number of firms that export to the US and Argentina are about the same, but Argentina is a lot closer. Yeah, and, and for France, it's, it's Belgium and, and Germany or sure. Belgium and the US. Because, because sure. I, I just wonder if you could go over the intuition of the alphas. I think you said quickly, I mean, I heard, I, I, was, I'm, I was a little slow to- Yeah, no, I, I went too fast over that. Going from like, if, if I understood what you said, if I'm in a big market, it's much easier for me to go from the 50th to the 51st percentile than in a small market. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the 50th to 51st percentile in terms of what? Say you're the share of the market you're selling yeah. to. Yes, that's right. So you're saying there's something inherently different about dynamics in a, in a large market than in a small yeah. Yeah, that's right. And so the, the alphas are being picked up in here by, uh, in large part by the, you know, the, the level and the slope in this figure. Hmm. Uh, they're also being picked up to some degree by the slope of the exit rate here, because the alpha, let me jump to the model here, the alpha, this guy, uh, does govern to some degree the marginal cost of the very, very first customer, which in turn governs exit. Uh, and to the, to the degree that exit rates vary systematically with you know, export participation and other destination characteristics, this alpha zero will you know, pick up that a little bit. Yeah, can you, could you generalize, because this is what I'd like to examine, is in your functional forms here, you've kind of combine the effect of the LJ with the M. Yeah, so you want a different exponent here maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's something that I have thought about. Uh, and I, it is a good idea. I'll tell you, to be honest, the reason that I do it right now is, uh, and it's not the best reason, but if you look at this guy, this is 10 moments, averages and slopes. I've got one more parameter. That's the overall multilateral export participation rate. Uh, guess but, how many parameters are in this table? Yeah, but aren't you identifying it all off the number of Brazilian exporters? Which I'm saying is kind of combine, combining the effect. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. I agree with you. Uh, I, I think this is really important. I mean, I, I, it would be, I think it would be very exciting for you to nail this because yeah you know, no i see your point yeah you're imposing a, a kind of non-fractal functional form here and i i could start and i, I always thought of costas's model as sort of fractal yeah you know, that i it's kind of scale invariant and you're imposing some scale variance here uh yes that's correct and it would really be nice to know if, if the data support. I mean, I'm, I'm agnostic. I don't know if that's true or not. Well, but you're right. I think the data, I'm sure the data could, I could find a way to make the data tell me what that exponent should be and how different it should be from this one. I agree with you. It is something that I have thought about. Okay. Uh, I have not done it yet, but I, it's a great suggestion. I have a class, but great, great paper, Joe. I really great. enjoyed it. Uh, I appreciate your comments, Jonathan. Yeah, if anybody else has anything they, they want to say. Yeah, uh, we got Praveen raised her hand. Go, yeah, go ahead, Praveen. Uh, 
uh, question about uh, uh, like so I, I just want your view uh, nothing about uh, like so uh, so uh, like whenever exchange rate changes uh, it might have different uh, marginal cost effect because of on different firms because of different import intensity uh, they are importing different amount and then there might be different financial yeah. uh, like trade financing effect as well uh, because of the relationship with banks and like uh, uh, maybe like a lot of firms export in dollars so how uh, uh, how easier they are able to get dollar financing so there might be heterogeneous effect across firms because of changes in ex exchange rate uh, yeah I, I don't have that at all and my my gut instinct is perhaps that has something to do with what's going on in, in this picture a little bit. It may be that, you know, uh, firms that are exporting to say the US and Argentina, the really easy destinations are more integrated in some kind of multinational, multinational supply chains. And they import a lot more, you know, foreign intermediates that are becoming more expensive or something like that. I don't have that here in this model, but you're right. That, that could go part of the way towards explaining, you know, why there's this, you know, the model does not explain quantitatively why we see such a large difference in export responses across destinations during this episode. I can't tell you why that is. So what, what did you even do here? All I did was just- Are you running like an export demand equation, export supply equation where you're controlling for demand in the, in the destinations and then you estimate a different elasticities? No, I'm just averaging these things across the destinations. That's all I'm doing. There's lots of other things that are going on that's going on in here. Yeah, it might be nice to do something like that, given that um, a lot of the easy destinations might be countries that had recessions as well. Like, you know, 2001, Argentina's right there. They're right next to Brazil. And so, I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, you see that so if they're having recessions, their demand's going to go down. I mean, that, that would even that's going to push this difference up even larger. No, no, I, I'm guessing that Argentina is a pretty easy destination for Brazil. Yeah. yeah. And so that exports to Argentina like uh, are, yeah, are kind yeah. of lagging because they're, they're kind of suffering in this period. Uh, yeah, there's uh, a, a lot of, a lot of the... I, I'm just saying, I think it would be useful to kind of do like a full, full, you could kind of estimate like an import demand equation that controls for what's going on the, yeah. the destination uh, I'm market. Just, would, this is not intended as like a, a rigorous exercise. It's just simply, I was saying, look, you do actually see something kind of like this yeah. one episode that I've got in the data. Sure. But that's a fair point. Yep. Uh, sorry, I just have a brief comment about this point. Actually, Argentina is, if not the first, the second destination of, Argent of Brazilian industrial products. So that might be a good point. And uh, the definitely second, agree. The second thing is, in terms of these supply chain multinational firms, maybe you might want to try by excluding, for instance, the car industry sector, okay. because it's actually one with a really high weight in the bilateral trade between Brazil and Argentina. Okay, and fine. Um, that's, that's a good suggestion. In the past, I did this all this stuff using some data from Mexico and there I got rid of, uh, you know, I did it with and without Mac and Ladores and you get all the same results, but here that's probably a good suggestion. I can try it with, uh, ever try everything excluding the car industry. Uh, anything else? Yeah, maybe we've dragged Joe around enough uh, today. Give him a break. A half. That's like a normal. That's a normal. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm thank gonna ask. I'm gonna ask Joe a bunch of questions, but um, sure. go ahead. Go ahead, Kim. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say thanks to everybody. Uh, we can turn the recording off. Uh, <laughs>